Right, I think we'll, um, we'll get cracking if we can. I've got uh, apologies from Anna Bradley, who is away. Um, uh, the minutes, everyone happy with the minutes? I wasn't here at the meeting, but Michael, you happy with the minutes? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think the matters arising are all picked up. So, David, into your report, please. Thank you, David. Uh, thank you, David. Good morning, everybody. So, um, um, this is really a report which is updating uh, colleagues um, in relation to progress we're making. So, the first um, item is really about uh, a transformation update. And the first two or three paragraphs are really updates on the inspections, uh, the publication of the handbooks, the changes to the structure, uh, the progress we're making on recruitment, um, the development of a new induction uh, programme, which uh, began in earnest um, uh, this week uh, on Monday, and the fact that now uh, a number of the newly formed teams are actually uh, spending time in away days really focusing on their purpose and how they're going to achieve that. Um, next paragraph, on uh, uh, second paragraph on page two is really something that I tried to put in my weekly message to staff this week, which is um, one of the experiences is uh, the gap between what we've committed to deliver uh, as an organisation in support of staff and uh, the reality of that arriving. Uh, we're in a recruitment exercise, all staff haven't yet arrived. The academy is forming and has begun to deliver, it's not fully up and running. And um, uh, what I'm trying to do is just make um, that issue uh, transparent and acknowledge the work that um, many people uh, in the organisation are undertaking and the, the pressure that they feel. I think the mitigation of that pressure is in the appointment of staff, the development of the academy, but um, uh, that hasn't yet arrived. So uh, we continue to make progress on that and look at how we can ease that. Um, the development work which is continuing uh, over this next few months is really about how we handle concerns, complaints and whistleblowers. Michael's looking at this through um, his committee and um, we continue to um, uh, make progress on that and that seems to me to be a hugely important uh, issue, not because of the debate in the system about uh, complaints and whistleblowing but um, because of the imperative for us to uh, get this right as part of our work. Um, the um, last report from our Audit and Corporate Governance Committee uh, on the transformation programme made some recommendations around focusing on uh, the underpinning systems and processes and management. And um, that's been built into uh, the work that we're undertaking. 360-degree uh, feedback is an example of that, and all members of the executive team have now undertaken that and completed that and are involved in discussions with... Um, um, the company that are undertaking the 360 degree feedback and um, I think that's a significant development and I have to say um, I, I'm personally very pleased with the, with the progress that we're making. And then later um, the, in the summer in July we've got a further external gateway review of the transformation project uh, program which will give us some uh, additional external scrutiny and uh, commentary on the progress that we make. So an important uh, aspect of the work on transformation. Um, <coughs> pushing on a uh, significant event um, um, on the 14th of May with a CARE uh, Act receiving royal assent. Um, uh, the real focus of the CARE Act uh, in, um, um, in the media has been about the changes in relation to the NHS. I think the significance of this is it changes significantly the legislation around adult social care, where the whole shift of the system moves towards promoting the well-being of people in the system rather than uh, the 1948 uh, mode, which was really about less eligibility in many respects. Uh, uh, so a significant, um, a significant development um, um, across health and care, but also significantly for us. Next paragraph is really about regulations, um, and this is live work. Um, CQC colleagues are working very well with colleagues in the Department of Health. The majority of these are in Paul's area and are looking at the uh, regulations in some quite fine detail. The consultation on these regulations has now ended. Regulations are being drafted and we're working closely uh, with DH. What we've set out in paragraph three are the processes which need to be gone through 
um, in Parliament for those regulations to um, uh, be available to us for the 1st of October. So um, the fundamental standards will go into Parliament in early June. They need affirmative resolution, and uh, if nobody raises any uh, concerns in that 30-day period, uh, they'll be in place to be available from the 1st of October. Uh, You'll be aware that the duty of candour and the fit and proper person test was um, on a slightly different track than the fundamental standards. And um, the department's ambition is that they are also available for the 1st of October. Uh, but there is more work that is required on those standards. And that's the subject of um, some quite detailed work between Paul's team and um, the Department of Health's team. Um, so the work that's going on at the present time is really about what the next steps are that are required to get those regulations through. And then the uh, work that we will need to do is ensuring that uh, our inspectors and um, Rebecca's colleagues in legal are aware of precisely what the standards say and what they mean when they're actually applied in practice, because from that date we won't be running under the old regulations, we'll be running under the, these new regulations. Um, so that's a significant issue. And um, uh, this week, uh, the executive team, we were looking at what work we needed to do where we can front load the development uh, and training of staff so that they're uh, good to go from the 1st of October when these regulations come into force and there'll be similar issues about how we can brief providers on the detail of the regulations so um, a, a lot of work still to do and um, but those two paragraphs are just raising the key issue okay. yeah just a quick question on, on the fundamental standards you mentioned that um, work's being done between the Department of Health and Paul's team and I mean I, I suppose what I'd like to know is to make sure that the fund fundamental standards will actually do what they were intended to do. And that will be practicable on the front line, so it makes sense to patients and it makes sense to our inspectors and staff. So it's about how, how are we, and the Department of Health, making sure that we kind of keep it real. Because, you know, you can have people sitting in an office in an ivory tower making decisions, uh, and then it they come up with something that actually doesn't do what was intended. Um, so I'd, it's just sort of how we can make sure we keep it real for people who are going to be um, either delivering them, inspecting them, or receiving them. And um, you put your finger right on the debate that's going on between ourselves and the department at the minute. It's about how we actually keep that real and keep it meaningful. And how, in many respects, it's true to what the government agreed to do when they accepted Francis's report and actually said that they'd actually introduce an action plan in relation to this. So, um, um, and this comes down uh, not just to what the standards are and how they're described, but what enforcement action can be taken and what will be subject to criminal proceedings. Uh, this is a breach which... Uh, um, uh, requires criminal proceedings and what's a breach that would require civil proceedings um, okay. so that's about, exactly yeah, the issue yeah. so it's about having a dialogue um, sort of along the way and not just sort of when it's all decided that we then tell people so it's whether there's a, the opportunity to have some sort of engagement and dialogue as it's sort of going along really um, I don't think there's any chance that there's going to be an engagement strategy between now and then the we're you know, there's been a huge amount of engagement with people. They've consulted on these regulations and standards. It's been out. It's now come back. I think we're now in that end game of ensuring that they're drafted in a way which is picking up the comments that have come through and are true. Uh, in many respects, what I'm saying, Kay, is this time scale between now and um, the 1st of October, I think um, it's very tight in terms of working days. It's about 45 working days, I think. Uh, so, in terms of what we've done already on the engagement, so we in the back in June of last year, we kicked off with the new Stark, one, which, which went explicitly after the fundamental standards. So we feel we have a pretty good view on what people are saying. Also, obviously, in light of all the work that Robert Francis had done, the department, with quite a bit of help from us, then drafted the draft set of regulations, which they then consulted on uh, for I forget whether it was six or eight weeks. Um, and then once they go into the House 
uh, House of Parliament so they can be debated if necessary. Uh, we then put out our guidance on how we would use those standards under uh, the registration and the enforcement guidance, all of which we will then consult on. So we'll have quite a few opportunities, but as David says, the absolutely the key bit for us is I think we feel we understand from what people have told us. So if it's a question about can we hold a provider to account through a criminal prosecution for leaving a user of services installed sheets, then we're just not budging on the need to do that. Um, um, paragraph four is um, you'll be um, aware that um, on the uh, revalidation of doctors is a requirement that any organisation that employs doctors needs to put in place a revalidation. So paragraph four is basically setting out um, that Nigel Sparrow, who's one of Steve's team, will actually be the responsible officer at CQC in relation to this function. And um, the process, apologies for the last sentence in this paragraph, which has got rather uh, scrambled, but um, what uh, I'm obliged to do is bring a report to the board and the regulations require a, the board to have sight of the process by which um, that responsible officer's uh, uh, work is taken forward and um, will bring a report forward uh, um, in the next few months which actually will set out what the proposals are for how we should deal with that uh, in terms of the doctors that we directly employ. There'll be other doctors that work with us whose uh, revalidation will be done by their employing body rather than by us, but there's a number that will be done by us and Nigel will take that uh, forward. And his approval as that responsible officer comes from, I think it's from Sally Davis and that authorisation has come through. So this is the beginning of a process that allows us to uh, put in place a revalidation of um, those uh, clinical colleagues that we directly employ. Um, but it's also flagging that there's a board level uh, deliberation required of that, and I'll bring forward the further details. Um, remainder of this report is really updates. The more convey investigation has begun, uh, and um, witnesses have now been called. Uh, one of our colleagues from CQC is uh, giving evidence there today. Um, David Dalton's review in relation to um, different models of hospital provision is now underway. I, I was invited onto it. The reality is that Paul's attended the two meetings that have been held so far. Um, our appointment processes continue. Um, um, uh, Sally Warren, I think, is a new name uh, uh, who will join uh, Andrea's team uh, from next month. And uh, Steve Eileen and myself interviewed for... Um, a Deputy Chief Inspector in Primary Medical Services on Monday of this week and we've offered that and those processes are just going through and um, once we've got those clearances we'll announce, uh, publicly announce the name. And then the very last paragraph, David, uh, is a slightly technical thing. We um, are on track to produce the annual report and accounts in terms of finally signing those off. They'll come to the board but I think there may well be a gap between the board and as sending off the reports, and I think this is asking for a delegation to me to make those minor adjustments that will be needed as the numbers come in at the end of um, uh, the process of finalising the annual accounts. I won't uh, authorise any significant changes, but these will be numbers that change uh, in a minor way, uh, just so we can get the finalisation and meet the deadline. Um, so that's the update report, and as I say, a request just for delegation for the finalisation of the accounts for the annual report. Any questions for David on his report? Can I just ask one question? On the, the Dalton Review, which is looking at chains of hospitals, but also looking, we discussed last night at the, at the dinner last night a little bit about big hospitals versus small hospitals that are delivering good care and efficiencies and what have you. I mean, is there anything coming out of your inspections, Mike, that will feed into the Dalton Review about the future size of hospitals or the optimum size of hospitals? I don't think we're there yet, um, but as we do uh, more, yes, we will look at um, what the quality of care is we see in, in large hospitals versus small hospitals. But I think it's important to remember that 
we have deliberately skewed the sample of hospitals we've looked at to begin with. We have chosen to look at predominantly ones uh, which were high risk on intelligent monitoring, not exclusively because in wave one we deliberately also looked at some that were, were low risk. So I, I think until we've got further down the line, um, we're not really in a position to, to, to comment on that. But, but when, when we are, we will. Um, and equally, um, when we're in the uh, position when we've done enough hospitals that are being going through the Keo re-review process, if you like, we will see how some of those have um, fared with buddying arrangements. Not that it's for us to comment on those specifically, but we will certainly have observed. The kind, the kind of issue is, is that there is evidence, isn't there, that the more you do of a certain procedure, the better you get at it. And there are minimums that below which, if you go down, it may not be safe to do that kind of procedure. Are we, are we picking up those issues? And a lot of progress has been made nationwide on that. So, um, so f for, for example, stroke services are one, one of the best examples, but vascular surgery is another, a lot of cancer surgery. Um, and I think one of the things that perhaps hasn't been talked about enough over the, the last decade is how much centralization of complex surgery has actually gone on in, in the country. And certainly, if we were to come across places that were doing low volumes of surgery for which there is evidence that uh, the greater centralization would produce better outcomes, we will certainly comment on that. Just one point on that, because I'm sorry if, if I contributed to a misunderstanding last night about, I mean, I don't think Dalton is just, it's not just about big versus small. Um, I think for us, one of the more interesting aspects is really the whole issue of integration. You know, if you're Salford and you own the community trust, you know, that enables you to do a lot more in terms of discharge and logistics. I mean, it's a, it, and if you have, you know, if you're Valencia and you have your primary care inside your secondary care, you know, it changes the model. So I just think, I think those are also issues that we may or may, you know, we may at some point have some insight into. Because I think that's where it gets, that's where the added value ultimately is going to come from, isn't it? And, and again, just to say that we are committed, and that's <coughs> all three chief inspectors, to doing joint inspections when it makes sense. So if a hospital has some care homes attached, we will, we will do, uh, assess those at the same time. And we will look at the overall impact that, that that's having, or with, with primary care, the, the general practices that are managed by our acute trust. So I think there are, there are different models emerging, and I think our approach is ad adaptable so that we can look at all combinations. Just, just on that, I mean, there, um, in the end, the prize is a kind of integrated service, and the impact on how we carry out assessments is that we, which could be profound, is that it then becomes one about uh, about integrated care, and this does go to the heart of a, a, a kind of anomaly about how we do our work. I'm sorry to mention it after we're getting doing so well in attracting people, in, but there is a, um, a sense in which um, the, the NHS or the care system is trying to become more. Uh, individually driven, more built around the, the person who receives the care, so that everything that happens to them is the, uh, you know, the services are built around them, and their, to the totality of their experience is what we're trying to improve. Uh, but because of the way that CQC has been established, it is based on provider organisations. And that, that is a, a fundamental anomaly, which at some point we will have to turn to. And it may not be now, because we've had enough to do in, in considering our model, but it is an anomaly which we can't ignore. And the solution to it is that you have an integrated service. So it doesn't make sense in a way to be talking about um, how well your provider trust uh, 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 carries out its acute, your acute care if your um, longer term community care is poor. So the acute provider does well, but actually your care experience is bad. Um, Many of the services we're talking about, mental health is a very good example, are highly integrated. There are multiple providers who are not even in the mental health sector. Um, and understanding their contribution, which may be crucial to the overall experience of the person, is also uh, crucial. And of course, just to bring up the sort of unmentionable bit of this, that in the end, it is the commissioners who are responsible for organizing the totality of a person's care. And so there is a kind of contradiction at the heart of what we do, which is that we are trying to understand per individual experience by looking at their uh, chopped up care, uh, care uh, pathway. And until we address that, 
and maybe this review, I, I must say, I don't know what exactly this review is about. I suppose it would be useful to know, actually, because it's been mentioned so a few times now. Until we've addressed that, we, we um, will not be following the philosophy of care that we are there to support. Um, thank you for writing my job description. Um, the, uh, the, the, one of the main reasons for taking the role on was to do precisely what you're alluding that we should do. Um, so I lead on um, joined upness integration. And um, the way we're building the primary care model is to, is to move towards that. But we've had to prioritize general medical practice and, and the care delivery, as you quite rightly say. So we'll be going into each CCG local authority area we are now, instead of just doing a public consultation on a hospital, it's linked to health and care services across the patch. Um, you'll see in my report um, uh, and later something about joined up children's safeguarding services across a, an area. Uh, we're looking through uh, what we're doing to look at mental health and with uh, hopefully the recruitment of our new DCI um, start to look at acute care linking out of hours 111 and with Mike um, walk-in centres and um, A&E so the acute care so how do you define what a good quality service is for an area now inevitably when I go to meetings of GPs they say well who's assessing the commissioner well in a way if you think about it we're assessing the commissioning of services through the provision uh, and, and my vision is is the, the patient the family the care are right at the center of everything so that we encourage joined upness and Camilla's examples are, are two or three of of many others around uh, the world and in this country we can learn from and I, I do think we have a key role in in helping to take that agenda forward you're absolutely right good and just on the David Dalton should we are we, we, they've just said we might ask David Dalton to come to one of our meetings actually so we can find out exactly what he is doing okay Um, Steve, your report, please. Thank you. Well, I, I refer to the answer I've just given um, uh, on, on integration. Um, a, a couple of things just to highlight because the report's there for, for everyone to read. Um, firstly, on recruitment, um, it was sad to report that um, Matthew Trainer, who's one of our deputy chief inspectors, is moving to another role um, uh, with NHS England from the end of June, and therefore whilst we're hoping we'll have uh, the third of our four DCIs in post by the second week of June. Um, by the end of June, um, Matthew will be um, departing uh, as a career move, which we support him fully uh, in doing. Um, the lead on integration for me will move to Janet Williamson, who's the uh, DCI now for the central region, of course got a, a career of health improvement and uh, how taking positive things within health and social care forward and uh, uh, we, we're interviewing for a head of integrated care to work with very closely with Paul because we see the themed reviews as being key to a lot of what we're doing and um, a diabetic one is in final draft form now and makes really really good reading um, so on recruitment we're spending a lot of time interviewing and uh, I must say we're interviewing fantastic people and it's very difficult uh, to make decisions, um, but they are really, really good quality people. Um, out of hours, uh, we are now moving into, um, towards the end of that first uh, phase of out of hours inspections, and in the report you'll see that we're looking at um, moving now onto the, the second group, uh, the third group even, and um, I must say we're finding very good care. Care has improved um, remarkably since our ministerial review of out of hours care in 2010 and we'll be bringing a report to the board um, in July uh, which is a review of that ministerial review and where we are with out of hours despite the fact we celebrated great outstanding although we're not rating it outstanding yet of course um, practice in the press it didn't stop some newspapers reporting how out of hours care was poor we still don't quite understand why they did that it would have been uh, nice to have had an interview to discuss it um, but the report showed Cambridgeshire uh, was turned around remarkably as a result I believe of a CQC visit last summer 
which showed uh, there were inadequacies. And with great clinical leadership, we honestly couldn't find a fault in what we saw. Um, and that's very difficult when you're trying to find some faults as well as celebrating the good. It was uh, remarkable. But we've also seen some excellent care in Derbyshire, um, in Bristol, and in the big provider Care UK, which has put a lot of effort into um, their out-of-hours provider. Uh, and you can see that where they've been working for some time, the quality of care has improved. They've got some sites where a little bit behind, but those that are really motoring, um, we've been uh, hugely you know, appreciative of the, uh, the leadership there. Uh, we've started on the um, first wave of in-hours GP uh, inspections. Uh, we're learning a lot from um, what's happening. On both in-hours and out-of-hours, the key thing is about consistency, making sure the judgments made in one area are uh, similar to uh, another area for the same standard. And of course, we're all waiting um, for the final part of the consultation on the handbooks. And so what we're doing now in wave one will be adapted based on the feedback. We're very pleased with the number of people who've attended both um, external stakeholder events and also work with our internal teams. And um, the uh, feedback is very positive on what we're doing. So we're encouraged by that. Um, I won't say any more because it's all in the paper. Thank you. Camilla. Um, <coughs> just suddenly struck me as we're sitting here that um, you said a lot about things like medicines management and, and so on. Yeah. Um, what about diagnosis? How do you get at that? I mean, how do you, how do you, do you work back from, I mean, if I'm thinking about cancer, for example, we know that 25% of all cancers are diagnosed in accident and emergency. And we also know from various studies that a certain percentage of GPs appear to be missing a lot of cancers. Mm -hmm. I mean, is there a valid way of, work, of us looking at the way individual practices diagnose people? Because I'm not sure you've talked about that. Yeah. Really. Um, not specifically about cancer, though. Cancer, as you know, and Mike and I have been talking about cancer him for slightly longer than me, but together for, for years. Um, I think there's a number of ways we're looking at. One is through the intelligent monitoring program that Paul's leading on. Um, the second, is, a part of our remit as CQC is also to encourage improvement. And so one of the benefits of having a, a GP going on the visits is that even though the confidence limits in small practices uh, of, let's say, less than 2,000 patients, uh, it's difficult to look at reliable data. Um, one full-time GP would probably have seven or eight new diagnoses a year. Um, what we're trying to do is encourage GPs, in a way, many practices are doing this, but others have fallen behind, to review their new cancer diagnoses, particular if, particularly if they're in A&E or made outside the practice. But, but I believe all of us as GPs should be looking at all new cancer diagnoses as a significant event in the practice. So that's only a maximum of eight a day. But you can then look um, in detail at if the uh, patient uh, presented in a timely manner or couldn't get an appointment, or if they got an appointment, how many times did they see the GP before they were referred? Were they referred under the two-week wait? We know some GPs don't do that. Many do it a lot. So the data that Paul's bringing forward will help us to focus. Uh, but it's, all, it's, it's to learn how to improve. And then similarly, uh, continuing professional development of the whole GP team so that people aren't turned away. Uh, they look at symptoms, people who come back three or four times, they look more seriously. So part of the encouraging improvement is what we're trying to do there with the data. I've got a few okay. points. <laughs> um, it's three, actually. Um, the first one is um, just to say that I'm very pleased that you're going to be bringing a, um, us a, 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 a paper on how we're going to inspect what you've called sort of prison services, which obviously covers mm. immigration and prison, and because um, actually they're a very sort of vulnerable group of people, and I, I'm mm. not sure that we've sort of done it justice to date. So mm. Mm. Um, you did, it does say you're going to bring it in August, but I'm not sure there's a board meeting in August. So... Um, Maybe it, it'll be September. But anyway, it'd be, I mean, it's really good that we're going to do a signposting statement. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well spotted, but 
I'll be here on my own in August. Then. <laughs> yeah, maybe that was by design, wasn't it? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I'd, I'd like to sort of know a bit. You've done started some of the uh, inspections of um, GP surgeries, and I'm, uh, I'd be interested to know how um, you're getting the views and experiences of, of patients using the GP services, um, and maybe lo local people as well, lo local stakeholders. How that's kind of um, starting to take shape. And then the final point is um, about kind of relationship with the GP community. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's clear there's all sorts of myths out there about what CQC is demanding and doing. Most of it is, is, is wrong, frankly. Um, and it seems to me, I mean, I mean when a, you know, a, a, a new service population comes into regulation, almost inevitably there's a bit of a backlash because people think more work and... Um, you know, it's, it's not unusual. Um, but I just wondered if there's more, more to be done there. I'm not quite sure exactly what, but it seems to me that, that one message really is that actually regulation could be very helpful for GPs, you know, highlighting some of the real challenges that they're, they're facing. Mm. And actually, you know, the, the philosophy that we're kind of stronger together is, a, is quite a, a powerful one. And I think we've seen it in social care and we've seen it in hospitals. Um, so uh, it's just sort of get, get your view on that, because I know it's, it's difficult. It's a difficult context for you, <laughs> um, you know. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I enjoy um, uh, challenges. And, um, but I, I think, part of going to the second question first, I think there is something about celebrating really good and outstanding practice. And uh, as I said before, even when we were talking about great out-of-hours care, it was possible to turn that round. So, what we're trying to do with the press, both the trade press and, and the national press, is work with them on stories. Whether they put the good news on the front page or not is debatable, but we will carry on. Um, we're trying to engage more with um, social media because often people who, um, particularly my GP colleagues who've got something to say, will say it there. Last night it was about whether we allowed Beatles posters in GP surgeries. Uh, so we're not there about quality and taste, um, although I think that is very good. Um, the, um, when we start to, uh, when we're starting to recruit, at the moment, Nigel Sparrow and I, uh, and now our DCIs, are spending a lot of time running around the country talking to local medical committees, GP conferences, but there aren't enough of us. As we recruit, there will be more. And our inspectors are starting to do, uh, and their managers, some more local meetings. Yeah, a lot of it is myth-busting. Uh, and that's why the blog and, and Twitter and things uh, things are helpful. Uh, but the, the meetings, I was just talking to Chris Day, he's been to a lot of the engagement meetings. The feedback has been very positive about what we're trying to do about rating across the different patient groups. And feedback from the patient groups has been hugely positive about the fact they're included. And um, particularly if you're talking to the vulnerable groups, it's very rare that homeless people uh, get a say and the fact that they're actually named in what we're trying to do is something, even though, thankfully, relatively small numbers, hugely important. Ditto people who have learning disabilities. Uh, and so we're trying to do that. And, st and going into your first part, with stakeholders, Chris Day and his team, uh, through Paul, uh, uh, as part of Paul's team, are leading on that work. I think one of the benefits is looking at the system rather than the individual. And as we build this through individual service, as we build this through CCGs, what I believe we'll, we'll hear is we'll, believe, uh, we'll hear issues about the joined upness in mental health care, for example, access to talking therapies, um, crisis intervention. We'll get that feedback. And then with Paul Lelliot and his team and Mike, start to look at how we can uh, make statements about joined upness. And the final part was about saying difficult things about premises, one of the new regulations, in, as the old do, includes premises. Are the premises suitable to carry out the operation that are regulated for? And clearly, we'll make statements about that when we find it, as we will uh, about other uh, of the fundamental standards. Thanks. Just, just to be clear, are you talking to patients when you're doing inspections? Are you getting their views and experiences? So on that, yeah, so yes is the answer, but how you do it in a... Um, valid and reliable way. Um, I, my wife was in her GPs when CQC inspected them and she hid because she didn't want to talk to the inspector. I'm sure quite a few other patients are probably going to do that as well. Um, so it's talking to patient participation groups. It's looking at patient journeys. 
um, but also looking at patients who use services um, and there are lots of ways of doing that. Uh, we're also doing a, a trial, if you like, of experts by experience in half of the Wave 1 practices and not in the other half to see what the benefit is and see how we can improve that. Um, uh, Steve, I, I, agree, I agree that um, it, it is very good, actually, that, that we've got health and justice on your reports each time, because that is a previously neglected area of the system. Can I just check that when we talk about health in the justice system, um, we're not, not just talking about health care, uh, because there is much more to health. We're, uh, a population with a lot of health problems uh, and very often uh, detained in an institutional setting where their health problems are either missed or exacerbated in some cases. And so the issue is whether they are being uh, held in healthy environments as well as getting access to health care. Uh, and uh, just to illustrate what I mean by that, the, um, not only can prison, for example, be an unhealthy environment, but on release from prison, people return sometimes to an experience of uh, uh, mental health risk, high risk of suicide immediately on prison release, uh, to domestic violence, to alcohol, to, to uh, drugs so that the, uh, the risks within the system of the, ju the justice system are, are, are not just about the health care that they receive. Um, so my question is whether you're, you're looking at that. Uh, and just very briefly, if I just ask you about, um, a little bit like Kay's asking, I suppose, about the, what's available to you, when you so far when you've done inspections in relation to the data and whether you're able to get behind the data from GP, GP practices by talking to, to patients. For example, if you... Um, you know, the, uh, I don't know what the questions are actually, but if the questions were, can you get an appointment on the same day when you want one, which would be a very difficult question about general practice, the answer may well be yes, but the, the experience of people or the, the effort you have to go to in order to get that appointment, it can be enormous. You know, getting up early, ringing on the dot of half past eight or something, taking a half a day off work in order to take the call back. You know, the, there are... Um, the, that there is much more to what the initial data might show, and I just wonder whether you've already got a feel for how that might be addressed. So, thank you. Um, on that latter point first, because it's easier, you know, with short-term memory loss to remember. The, um, uh, the patient survey is really, really important, and, uh, and that gives us quite a lot of information um, and is sampled regularly uh, and is published. And so um, that gives us an indication before we go in as part of... Um, Paul's information uh, world, the intelligent monitoring, so you can focus on particular issues. And um, it, you know, if you haven't seen the survey, it's worth sampling a few practices, have a look at ours. We all have issues, but it's how the practice learns and, and improves. Uh, and talking to patients in the waiting room on the day or as they're leaving the surgery is one way of doing that. And uh, we're looking at how we can get a better sample because it would if you're only doing it on the day and they've got two weeks notice of when you go in you might find there's more receptionists that day and more appointments so so there are ways of, of looking at that um, although we are doing unannounced visits as well when we've got real worries uh, I'm pleased you highlighted uh, both of you the um, the criminal justice system um, as you know part of my drive in healthcare has been for the most vulnerable many of whom are in and out of prison and, and detention centers um, Sue uh, McMillan, who's my deputy leading on this, is also driven that way, and we're um, about to do a piece of academic research with um, uh, Northumbria University looking at domestic violence and using our visits, working with um, Chief Inspector of Const HMI Constabulary uh, and, uh, and others, uh, and, and looking at particular areas. And then if we find there are ways, of when we're going to GP surgery, to ask about identification of domestic violence, what are the issues? Uh, we'll be doing that as we do from the bottom up. Um, but the handoffs between prison, in prison care, and GP care are a major risk, both for physical and mental health. And I think we want to develop our methodologies to look both ways about how we identify that. Good point. Okay, Sorry, last, last one, very, very, quick, very small, just yeah. on surveys. Um, one of my relatives received a couple of months ago a giant survey about GPs which appeared to be in a letter which appeared to be nationwide from NHS England. Um, he was quite cross about it because the way it actually asked questions about appointments didn't really allow for the fact that some people have to <laughs> go through the kind of torture system. And I just thought that is a presumably a colossal amount of taxpayers' money has been spent on that survey. 
why did they do that survey rather than us, and do we have access to that data? Um, yes, we have access to the data. I think it's historic. We do some surveys, they do others. Um, it's commissioned from the Department of Health. But, I mean, we shouldn't be, you know, we should... I mean, the taxpayer just needs one organisation to ask the question and share it, don't they? That's yes. What I just sort of struck me. I just thought, I've never heard about that survey in this room. No, so I, th I think it, it's, it's certainly the biggest survey that's done in the NHS, the GP patient survey. It's currently run out of NHS England. So we, we do a number of other surveys, say uh, the maternity survey. Um, it's just in each case, that, uh, as things stand, the Department of Health has commissioned different surveys from different people. Okay. But it, uh, yeah. it's, it's well... The, the questions were not very well written, if I might say so. And I think, you know, if, if, whoever does it next time might want to consult Steve on how they do it. Yeah, I mean, I mean outside <laughs> this board, it, if you, yeah, as you are interested, it'd be worth us having conversations about how we influence it. Because yeah. we have questions we'd quite like to ask as well, yeah. using... Uh, I think we should move on. Um, Andrea. Thank you very much. Um, uh, like Steve, I'll um, not go over everything in the report because you've read it, but just wanted to highlight um, uh, four key areas. Um, the first was on uh, the uh, Wave 1 uh, inspections um, uh, that um, we, we'll have done. Uh, we've completed the 250 um, uh, Wave 1 inspections. We have absolutely, as... Um, uh, David B and um, uh, uh, keeps on reminders, reminding us we are learning by doing, um, and we have indeed learnt um, uh, during the Wave 1 inspections. There have been some difficulties, um, but some uh, significant positives um, that we can take out of it, particularly in uh, the more rounded view um, of a service that we've been able to achieve um, through uh, the inspection process. But what we are finding from our inspectors um, is that it is taking longer and that, you know, the, the, the new approach to writing the reports and making sure that we're presenting that information in a succinct um, uh, way um, uh, has been a bit of a challenge. So there's some considerable work for us to do in taking the results of the evaluation of Wave 1 into the changes that we need to make for Wave 2. Um, and that's uh, something that we are working um, with Paul's uh, team from the policy point of view, um, Rachel Dodgson and others, um, to, to try and progress that and also to make sure that uh, the training that we have in place for people for Wave 2 um, is, is more extensive uh, and picks that up. Um, secondly, I promised you an oral update um, on the roundtable on covert surveillance, um, uh, which happened on Monday of this week. Um, and, uh, 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 and it was very good. Um, uh, we were joined by um, a, a wide range of, of participants, including um, David Hogarth in the audience today, um, uh, who was one of our panel members who gave a perspective um, on uh, the use of both covert and overt surveillance um, in services. And we did have within the room um, every flavour of, uh, of, of view that has been expressed to us since um, a, a fresh start was published published last October uh, from you know, people who kind of think that we should be doing it everywhere and yesterday um, through to uh, uh, folk who are uh, very concerned um, uh, about uh, the, use of, uh, the use of cameras. I've written a blog which was published yesterday afternoon just reflecting on some of the key points that came out of uh, the, uh, the, the, dis the discussion. In relation to uh, CQC's use of covert surveillance, I think that there was um, a lot of unanimity of view that this should be a last resort um, and you know, that we would need to be using it judiciously in terms of um, uh, seeking out evidence where there were specific concerns that we couldn't unearth in, in any other way. In terms of using um, uh, cameras in other environments, uh, we were asking the question, well, you know, what, what could CQC helpfully do around all of this? And I think, again, there was a sense um, from the providers, people who are using services, carers and others um, within the room, uh, that we, working with other regulators, um, uh, 
it, we could helpfully provide some guidance um, and some insight into how we would use information that people presented to us and uh, and support uh, for for providers in, in making um, sometimes quite difficult decisions. So there's more work to be done, um, but it was um, a really helpful discussion, and um, uh, I was um, very ably supported by a whole ton of people from throughout the organisation, including um, uh, Rebecca's um, uh, policy team, the engagement team, and the policy team. So we'll we'll keep on coming back to com coming back to that. The third um, uh, point. Um, uh, was about the registered managers. Um, uh, the board will, I'm sure, recall um, the conversation that you had in September generated by David's report at that time because um, uh, I was only a attending an observer capacity um, at that meeting as I wasn't in post yet. Um, but we've been progressing with the project looking at those um, uh, locations which at that time did not have a registered manager in post um, um, uh, for longer than six months. Um, and you know that the, the most important news is that actually we have increased the numbers um, of registered managers in post in those places. That's what we want to see. Um, that's the whole purpose of doing it. Um, we have um, uh, issued uh, fixed penalty notices um, to uh, about a quarter of those of those locations, and we were we are now progressing um, with this through our normal uh, inspection process in terms of um, providing information to inspectors about registered managers, that the length of time that there's not been one, and what we're expecting them to do um, to make sure that there is one. We've equally been in conversation with providers and understanding that, of course, there are circumstances where it's very difficult to get a registered manager in post. There's, there's clearly turnover and we can't magic these people up overnight. Uh, and so we have to be proportionate and reasonable in terms of our expectations. Uh, and I think there's also uh, a, a, a role and responsibility for all of us in the sector to be promoting um, uh, the registered manager's um, role um, as an incredibly important post uh, and valuing that um, uh, in, in the way that we go about the work that we do. And I do apologise um, about um, uh, a third, uh, two thirds of the way down the page, um, the paragraph that starts of the original 2,439 locations identified, that paragraph should have come out because it's actually the table up above. So I apologise for, um, <laughs> I was trying to clarify matters and um, perhaps only succeeded in making it worse. But. Um, uh, and the, the, the fourth point that I just wanted to highlight um, uh, was the uh, uh, Panorama programme, um, which uh, occurred obviously in between our last meeting and this. Um, and I've set out uh, in uh, uh, paragraph 2.5 uh, the areas that were highlighted that by that programme, um, the uh, our focused and, and involvement uh, in those in those um, homes, and you've also got the statement that we issued um, and the uh, at the time uh, on the day of the program and the blog that I wrote the day afterwards uh, in response to it. I think that the important things to say about that is that the care that was shown on that programme was completely and utterly unacceptable, and uh, we have been very clear that that is the case. Um, also very clear um, that we need to be res responsive to people, both um, uh, relatives and people who are using services, but also staff uh, in responding to the concerns that they raise. Um, and, and that um, you know, there are different circumstances uh, in each of those locations. Uh, but I think that one of the things that I am heartened by in terms of the information that I've had back from inspectors doing the first wave of our new approach is that they do feel that they are able to get under the skin of the services in a much more meaningful way to pick up some of those signs um, and, and to explore much further um, what is happening in terms of the culture, governance, management and leadership of services, which is where um, uh, uh, the, you know, um, people feel that they can uh, continue um, uh, to, to provide care in an inappropriate way, and we need to be, you know, really, really rooting, rooting that out. Um, so happy to take um, any questions, obviously, on all of that. Uh, well, thanks very much. The, um, just on, on the Panorama programme, um, 
I'm sorry to repeat myself from last night or even keep referring to last night when lots of people weren't actually there. <laughs> but uh, the, uh, we had a discussion last night about, about this in a, uh, in a different CQC setting. And um, uh, without repeating all of that, I think that, the, that one of the main things that came out of that program for me was the, uh, the untapped resource of uh, families and family opinion, um, particularly in spotting the early signs uh, of a care home in difficulties. Uh, or staff behaving inappropriately. Uh, and uh, our task, I think, uh, is to uh, ensure that that resource is not left on the sidelines. And the, the, um, uh, that's made particular. I mean, you could say that's true across the entire care system, but it's probably particularly true here uh, because we are talking about a, uh, a client group, um, a group of people who are receiving care who may not be, because of dementia or some other reason, may not be in the best position to represent their own interests. Uh, because of the enormous uh, range and number of, of uh, locations that, that might need to be uh, inspected and judged. Um, and because, that's, uh, because all of that is true even before we get into the home setting itself where everything is magnified. So um, uh, I, I just um, don't think we have to, you have to have all the plans now, but I think in the end where we need to get to with this is a much greater concentration on the reaction of, uh, of uh, families. And, uh, on the views of families and the early warning that families might, might provide. Um, and uh, although I think that um, CCTV may help us, uh, I do think that the benefit from engaging families better is, will be much greater than the technological solution. And you took the words right out of my mouth, Lewis, because that's the connection to be made between um, the round table that we had this week on covert surveillance and, and this. And, and that was a message that was coming out loud and clear um, from people um, uh, like the Relatives, Relatives and Residents Association, Your Voice Matters um, and others, which is that we do need to be listening to families. We need to be responding um, uh, to the issues that they're raising and we need to make sure that that insight site through our intelligent monitoring um, guides us um, in when we inspect and what we focus on when we do that inspection um, uh, and, uh, and in terms of the expectations that we're setting um, uh, for services. So I think, I think you're absolutely right. The only other point that I'd make is that obviously there are many people who are using adult social care services who don't have families um, and, and we need also to be thinking about how we we ensure that um, we are getting the insight um, uh, about services, um, you know, particularly for people who, who don't have somebody who can speak up on their behalf. And that's where um, ensuring that staff are listened to within the service is really important. That's an expectation that we would have of a well-led service, but also that we need to be thinking about um, and reacting um, uh, to the concerns that um, uh, uh, staff um, who are whistle blowers um, to us about um, concerns that they have is really important too because they may well be um, the people who will raise that for, on behalf of folk who don't have a family. Can I come just briefly on that? The, the, I, I agree with you. The, the point about, the, about people who don't have families is absolutely right. Although if we, if we think of this as not just a CQC resource but, uh, but as a public resource, then those people will benef benefit too. Um, so, you know, if there is a, is a, a, a family alert uh, not just expressed to CQC, but publicly accessible, um, then that will drive the care of the people who don't have the families to, to represent them. Um, and if you like, this is, uh, I'm calling for a, a, a kind of sea change in how we do that, a real step up in the scale of what we offer to, uh, to families in the way that they can represent um, their concerns. Um, you know, it's a sort of, it, it can sort of be uh, talked about as a kind of trip advisor effect because it has some similarities with that. This is a, um, a uh, I'm thinking more of a publicly accessible, um, universally available, um, uh, set, uh, uh, but at the same time sort of reliable set of uh, um, uh, opportunities for feedback, which we would make use of, but which also would be available to uh, people choosing a care home. It would be available to people who... Um, to, to the providers of care homes themselves to know a little bit more about how people view their service. 
Um, thank you. And, and we are in conversation um, with Paul's um, intelligence team and others um, to be looking at some of the um, uh, services that are already existing where people can indeed do that, like care opinion, which has grown out of patient opinion, um, uh, uh, family good care, which I declare my interest, that was um, uh, uh, developed by the Social Care Institute for Excellence. There are a variety of places um, where... Um, uh, people are able to to, to, to leave their uh, their comments and thoughts, which we can draw in and use. Um, <clears throat> the, the sad fact is, however, actually people don't do it very often um, uh, in, in, in adult social care settings uh, because of the concern that they have of the impact and however anonymous you might make that and confidential you might make that, um, people are concerned about, um, uh, about how that might be used and how it might impact on the care of their loved ones. So the other aspect, which is you know, um, uh, our uh, opportunity for people to share their experience with us directly is also really, really important. And, and that is something that I think that we need to constantly be promoting. And the very last thing that I'd say is that when Steve is doing his listening events um, in primary care, um, certainly I've been doing these sorts of things for donkey's years, um, and however much you want to kind of talk about one aspect of the service that you're regulating, people will come along and talk about other things as well. And we need to be making sure that we're making a huge virtue out of that and actually using those broader opportunities um, to... Uh, to, to gain insight um, from uh, people who are either using services or indeed um, visiting or caring uh, for people who are using uh, adult social care services as well as primary medical services. Yeah, um, a couple of things. On the um, uh, listening to families, which I absolutely agree we, we have to do, but I think we need to be a little bit careful about using... Um, other families as a proxy measure for people who um, don't have families very heavily involved um, because people who do abuse will be very aware of, of people's vulnerabilities and I'm mindful of, I can't remember the place, but there was um, a, a, an, another home that, that um, a, a, fa a family uncovered abuse um, and put in a hidden camera, um, but other families were very positive about the home, so we just need to be a bit careful, careful about, about that. Um, I'm just going back to the um, the sort of covert surveillance and just to sort of check um, how, how we're going to, to take it forward when we finally um, settle on, on what we're going to do because there's kind of two bits to it. One is um, whether we use um, sort of covert surveillance in our methodology which could be hidden cameras or mystery shoppers. So that's, I guess, one aspect for us. And the other one is, um, you know, what do we do because some providers, um, I know there's one provider that said, you know, we're going to offer families CCTV. Um, so it's a sort of opt-in type thing as opposed to it all being done, being done all the time everywhere, which I doubt, frankly, would, um, would happen. Um, but it is likely that um, there is going to be the option, at least in some places, for um, overt surveillance. Um, and I just... You know, there's all sorts of things around that, you know, dignity and, you know, what's, you know, weighing up risk benefits and whether people have the capacity to make the decision, um, you know, what's a proportionate response. And I just wondered, what, you know, are we going to, oh, I suppose we've got to make a decision about whether we use covert surveillance in our methodology, but then the other, the other aspect about providers is, I, I guess, would that be about issuing guidance and then following up it up in inspections thank you very much Kate um, uh, I agree with you about the caution point so um, um, the in terms of responding to your question um, we asked three very specific questions in the consultation on the adult social care provider handbooks so um, the round table was part of that kind of ongoing engagement and involvement of people in um, uh, 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 getting views about that and once the consultation is concluded and we can kind of um, uh, get all of that together we will be coming to a considered decision and a response on that. Um, so that will be part of the uh, feedback on the consultation. 
Secondly, on the overt surveillance, um, we, um, <clears throat> what was quite striking, I think, um, from the, the conversation that we had on Monday and you know, evident through other engagements and interactions that people have, have had with me, um, not least via Twitter, um, is um, the, 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 it would be useful for us to um, offer some kind, some kind of guidance around this, um, taking into consideration uh, uh, the, the issues that you've quite rightly highlighted need to be um, taken into account when people are considering this. But also, I think, emphasising uh, that you know, we need to be making sure that we're thinking about the purpose of all of this, which is to provide safe, compassionate, high quality, effective care. How do we best go about doing that? And you know, there are other issues that we would be wanting to see um, being put in place, not least the recruitment, the training, the development, the numbers of staff, um, the, their management, their leadership, um, and the culture of openness and inclusivity, um, both with people using services, but also um, their families and carers and the and the broader community so it's got to be part of a, a of a wider picture um, but I think that people are very keen for us to provide some guidance I'll be working with Rebecca and her team but also um, the um, I forget the complete the proper name, the Office of the Surveillance Commissioner, um, uh, um, who has um, uh, has a code of conduct around this as well. And what we need to be making sure is that is joined up um, uh, for people in this particular circumstance. So that's what we'll be looking at trying to achieve. Um, just to what extent, on Panorama and the... Um, to, to what extent are we active in pulling out messages for local authority commissioners in, in our work? because um, that's clearly a, a, and their contract monitoring. Um, it's, it's a very important part of what we do. I mean, um, uh, th there's two aspects for the um, relationship with local authorities. One is, as you quite rightly say, around commissioning, although let's not forget that um, about half of the commissioning um, of certainly residential care is self-funders. Um, uh, um, uh, although that is variable across the country in terms of um, uh, uh, the, the, the levels of, uh, of um, local wealth. Um, but secondly, on a safeguarding basis in terms of the local authorities' responsibility um, uh, for um, uh, safeguarding and protecting um, at all levels, so not just the ones that uh, they provide uh, uh, they're, they're providing the services for or commissioning the services for. Um, so, so we're very mindful of that and uh, working closely with local authorities is an absolutely key um, aspect of what I'm expecting the adult social care inspection teams to be doing. So we've organised the teams so that they relate on a local authority boundary to local authorities so that there are lead re um, management uh, relationships between local authorities and our local inspection teams. Um, where there are concerns um, and particularly where safeguarding um, alerts have been raised, again, that is a very proactive um, uh, uh, relationship. And for example, particularly in the respect of the old deanery and St Mary's Court, there's been a lot of interaction between ourselves and, and, and Essex County Council in terms of um, uh, uh, each other advising um, on, on what's happening, our uh, insights and understandings about what's happening there so that they can use our information uh, uh, to inform their decisions. I think that as time goes on, we need to be making sure that we're not duplicating efforts between local authorities um, and CQC inspections, that they are confident in using the information that we've got, but we're also confident about using um, uh, their, you know, the things that they can pick up because they're there on a local basis as part of our intelligent monitoring. So it's, you know, it is part of a, a very significant bit of the working relationship that we've got. That's, that's all good. I, I was just thinking about a sort of almost a national profile in us publishing stuff and, and being a national resource for the... So I think one of the things, do you want to say something about area profiles, which I think um, go in part to that, but I don't think we've ever summed the area profiles into a national profile, which I think is where your question comes from. So it's a good, 
it's a good challenge. Yeah. 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 Yes, I mean, I think there's, there are two things. One, one, as David quite rightly says, sort of representing back to local authorities, health and wellbeing boards and local health watch, what the picture is locally in terms of the, the, the services that we're seeing. But secondly, I think we've got a real opportunity, particularly with the state of care report, um, to be thinking, and I'm t obviously taking the words out of Paul's mouth there as he's nodding, um, using the state of care report as a way to kind of translate that information back into these are the things that you should be looking out for. This is what we're seeing. This is the good practice that we're seeing, as well as the warning signs that you need to be thinking about when you're commissioning services. Um, we had done a, a inspections of a total of 49 acute trusts. I'm pleased to say that this week we will have passed the 50 mark. Uh, they are now in progress. Um, and as you know, I won't go through this in detail, but 18 of those were in the first wave, and then we've now done wave two, and we're into quarter one. Um, I thought what would be useful in this report is just to set out a bit more about what's happened, particularly in the wave two ones, where we have been routinely rating trusts as we go along and publishing the, the, those ratings. Um, it is important to remember, though, that the trusts that we selected for wave two were predominantly those which had been shown as high risk, but which we hadn't already done, or they were ones that were KOE reviews, or uh, there were a few in there that were also trusts who were aspiring to foundation trust status. So it's not a, a normal sample, if you like, of, of, of all the trusts in the country. Um, and uh, of those, uh, four have been rated as good, seven has been rated as requiring improvement, and one we rated as inadequate and has now uh, been put into special measures. Um, we've also set out here for you um, <coughs> how the, the good ratings compared with uh, where the groups that they were selected from in terms of bands one and two of um, intelligent monitoring. So I think the exception here, if you like, which proves the rule, is, is the Homerton inspection, where this is a trust that looked as if it was high risk uh, on intelligent monitoring, um, but in practice uh, the inspection team found very good uh, care and in fact rated the A&E department as outstanding. Um, so, um, th th but in general, I think there has been quite a close correlation between um, the intelligent monitoring and what we have found at inspection. Um, it's too early yet to comment on the re-reviews of the KEO trusts. All I can say at this stage is we have now re-reviewed, done the, the planned inspections of all 14, and so by uh, July we should have the reports of all of those through and we'll be able to, to bring those uh, together. Um, We've been uh, active in the mental health and community health service sectors as well, and again, just listed the, the trusts, and I'm pleased to say that now some reports um, have started to come out. Uh, the Wave 1 reports, clearly we were not even attempting to, to rate, um, but I think we have learnt a lot about the process of the mental health inspections and, and also about the process for how we best report on them and reporting... Um, by core service as opposed to by location. So if you are someone with eating disorders, it's probably easier to follow what we are saying about eating disorders across uh, a whole trust, which may be a large geography, uh, than it is to report on every one of 100 different locations where services may be provided from. Um, so uh, we, we hope that that is uh, the, a more... <coughs> an easier thing for people to understand and public to understand um, but, but obviously we would be very willing uh, hopeful that we might get comments from any of you about those reports and how they, they're looking um, and I then listed the, 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 the further trusts that are either now being uh, inspected or will be inspected very soon um, we're at much the same stage with community health services as we are with the uh, mental health in inspections uh, with a couple uh, published and others uh, coming imminently. Um, alongside all this, of course, we have continued with our uh, external engagement um, and 
particularly looking uh, forward to seeing what we can do in, in terms of intelligent monitoring for community health services. Um, I spoke with uh, <coughs> Andrea and Steve at the NICE uh, annual conference, and we've been doing a range of other uh, events uh, with the Foundation Trust uh, Network, NHS Confederation, uh, and others as, as listed. Um, very happy to take comments, questions. Uh, thank you, Mike. Any questions for Mike? Camilla? Could you just say something about um, Heather Wood and Wrexham and how the special measures mechanism is working? Uh, yes. I mean, so at, at Heatherwood and, and Wrexham Park, um, uh, first thing to say is we, we were very concerned about the, the quality of care, particularly on the Wrexham Park site. Not, not the, the Heatherwood site is an elective site and was really quite different. Um, and uh, so we... As, as per the, the plan, we, we make the recommendation uh, to either monitor or, or TDA, depending on what uh, the trust, in this case, to monitor, uh, about the trust going into special measures. This was uh, accepted, and so they then actually put the trust into special measures. There is a special circumstance here, which was that um, it was already uh, Frimley Park were in discussion with uh, Heatherwood and Wexham Park effectively about an acquisition um, and um, we were certainly very keen that putting it into special measures shouldn't hold that up, should if anything uh, accelerate whatever support was going to be needed uh, to get that trust turned round. Um, but since we put it into special measures it has actually been confirmed that that acquisition is going to go ahead. Sorry, and just that mean at what point do we then reinspect the new entity though well we're still working out our, our, our approach on that but um, you will remember that, that that Frimley Park we have already assessed but not rated um, and um, but it's one of the ones that we are planning an early reinspection in order to be able to rate it I think probably the easiest thing to do is to do an early reinspection to rate that before the formal um, merger and acquisition goes ahead um, but also while we're there looking at the well-led uh, domain in particular to look at what their plans are for the leadership of the combined trust as, as it is so proposed at present. Sorry, but so our rating will, will be for from uh, not for Our the rating whole, will be at from the whole we've, we've rated uh, Wexham. Well, know, we yeah. will rate Frimley, and yeah. then at some point in the not too distant future, we will need to go back either to the whole combined trust or certainly to the elements at Wexham Park that we found to be inadequate. We will want to go back there quite early on to make sure that progress is being made. Can I ask, I mean, have the people at Frimley Park? seen our report now and yes. said my good do we, we they still want to go ahead with the acquisition do uh, they? yes they do um uh, yes um are they uh, the to, to, to be honest heatherwood and wexham park shared the report uh with uh frimley park in confidence before it was published so that they were fully aware of what was going on but uh since then they have given every indication that they are planning to go ahead Mike, I think you uh, mentioned a key issue, which is whether the intelligent monitoring uh, it corresponds to what you find at in inspection. Um, and uh, I suppose the ideal thing would be that it does, but doesn't tell the whole story. <laughs> Otherwise, you wouldn't need the whole system. Um, I, I assume you're talking about the acute trust. What, what, is that also true of the areas where the, the initial information intelligent monitoring is a little bit thinner, like mental health or community services? Uh, I'll, I'll hand on to Paul very soon, but the answer, the answer is really we can only make the um, comparisons for acute at the moment because that's the only areas where we've got sufficient uh, in, intelligent monitoring uh, before we go on site. Um, so we, with the mental health inspections, for example, um, we have not been able to use intelligent monitoring to really to help us select which trust to go to first. Um, we've been doing that on basis of local information, uh, combined with what we may know from intelligent monitoring, but also largely doing it in those trusts that are candidates for foundation trust status, uh, where clearly we have to um, have assessed it before they can go, go ahead. Paul, do you want to comment on that as well? Well, I, I agree with Mike, really. The, um, this is worth saying that we, so we started the intelligent monitoring with the banding for inspections for acute in September, October, and with the second run, third run, towards the end of July. 
um, whereas we won't do that for mental health trusts until towards October of this year. So it's just sort of very different cycles. We don't have a comparator yet. I'm wondering what the internal process is for going back after an inspection here and bringing the data and comparing with the analytics people. Is there a kind of big post-mortem that's done about, well, how could this be low risk, but actually we found it as good and just learning? The, what we are asking our inspection teams to do is when they go on inspection to look very carefully at the intelligent monitoring and to work through with the trust uh, why that might be happening or why that might not be happening. So, for example, if um, this has happened at one or two places, uh, there are very high emergency readmission rates. What is there an explanation for that, um, that um, but re related to the patient population, the services they provide, whatever it may be? Um, so that the, the idea certainly should be that on each of our inspections, all the at risks and elevated risks from intelligent monitoring should be fully considered so that we, when it comes back to the report, we have at least considered those. Yeah, and is that then fed back to the analytics team who can then um, calibrate the, and re-modify their, their models? The analytics team form part of the National Quality Assurance Group that I chair, so they are hearing that discussion as we go through and they are contributing to it. And yes is the answer. Um, and, and we'll also, for the reports themselves, have a section in the future which uh, sets out each of the elevated risks and risks that we'd previously talked about through intelligent monitoring and explain what inspectors and our analysts had found. Mm -hmm. So we've got that lot of step. And that's, that's important for providers because even though we've always been extremely clear that intelligent monitoring is not a judgment, mm -hmm. it's an assessment of risk for the purpose of inspection, it does allow them to say th this is why there's been an update and why there isn't a dissonance between a report and intelligent monitoring. Yeah. And are they suggesting other indicators on the ground, the, 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 the hospitals suggesting other indicators that might actually improve our set? I, I don't think we've had any other nationally available uh, data sets suggested to us, but we're always open to suggestions on that. It, it tends to be more um, tweaks on, on the existing metric, so there are very one that we discuss a lot is uh, what the metric around whistleblowing should be. No one, no one disagrees with the idea that we should look very carefully at whistleblowing, but how recent that whistleblow is, whether the case has been closed, to what extent is where the discussion is. You've been doing this for 10 months now. Um, uh, I know it seems years. Um, but it, uh, and 50 acute trusts, a number of... When you go to um, FTN and, uh, and the CONFED, what sort of the response now to the process? I mean, the response is, is broadly very positive. We, we had um, a meeting with about uh, 100 attendees uh, that was jointly done by the Confederation and FDN uh, just a week or two back. Um, and people are at different stages, of course. Some, some people are still learning about what the process is. Some have been through it. Some are about to go through it. Um, we're in no way complacent. We know that things can be improved, but I think everybody, the almost universal view is this is far better than anything we have done before. Um, the, the concerns that they have are the concerns that we have, which are about consistency, 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 and particularly when it comes to ratings. Um, so making absolutely sure that we n know what we are assessing and that we are assessing it in the same way and I mean there are lots of examples of things that I certainly hadn't thought of at the outset so if you're assessing outpatient services and you discover that a percentage of medical records are not available when people attend the outpatient clinic what is an acceptable percentage of medical records not being available um, and at what point do we say that is so bad that it is inadequate? Um, and th those are things that there's no right or wrong, but, it's, we're, but what we do learn is that we have to ask that question in every place we go in order to be able to see, to be fair uh, to everybody. So the interesting thing is that the, the response from an audience of 100 is actually they're coming up with things that are helpful rather than, as it were, resisting the process. 
I don't think anybody is resisting the process. They just want to make sure that our process is as, as good as it can be, as do we. Well, may, uh, maybe uh, two quick points. You know, a number of the most... I thought I'd switch this thing off. Um, <laughs> That's someone saying, don't say it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Please say that. Or pause before you speak. Well, it, I've set it as silent, but obviously it uh, hadn't worked. Um, now, the, 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 the quick point is this. I think that when... Well, I, it's a question, really. When a report covers more than one hospital, we briefly touched on this last night, the trust report only... Um, uh, uh, the, the key findings are at the domain level for the whole trust, not at the service level. So to get to the service level, you have to go to uh, the individual hospital report. And I just wondered whether there should be more service level information in the, uh, in the trust report. Um, because the, you know, the trust report, you know, although they're already around 20 or 25 pages, um, it's nothing like the hospital report, an individual hospital report, which can go. I think the John Radcliffe one was 99 pages. So I think there's a sort of a, a compromise here, which is uh, I sort of felt the trust reports are slightly too short and don't have enough detail. Um, the hospital reports may be slightly too long, but, um, but Mike asked for feedback on the, you know, uh, on the reports, and that had struck me on the trust reports that often one really felt that I have to go to the individual hospital report to really understand this um, and I think it's because the trust report is perhaps at too high a level. Uh, the second point was actually about Lewisham and Greenwich. Uh, Mike mentioned Frimley Park which of course was our case of you know does all green allow a, um, a hospital to be rated as outstanding? Well Lewisham and Greenwich is all requires improvement and so the question arose, you know, the question arises, well, if something requires improvement in absolutely everything, um, is that hospital actually adequate or should it be rated inadequate? So, um, uh, sort of a question for Mike, really. Okay, um, First of all, on the trust level reports, I, yes, I do think they can be improved. I think the major emphasis we want in the trust level report is obviously on the well-led domain because that is a pan a trust and I think we need to make absolutely clear that the different elements of leadership are reflected in that report and to to a large extent that we're making sure that what we have learned from the different uh, approaches the focus groups as well as the, the listening event as well as the uh, interviews are all reflected there I think the easiest way in the trust level report to summarise the um, findings for the different locations is to show the grids for each location. Yeah. And that is something that we are planning to do um, from here on. Um, it's just taking a little time to get mm. the, the technology sorted out behind that. But, 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 but we will do that, because I think that gives you a quick at a glance. Um, you know, if, if you look, look at the Oxford report, that would then show you the John Radcliffe, the, the Churchill, the Nuffield Orthopaedic mm. Centre, and the Horton Hospital. And, within two pages you you would have the picture and then you would know okay well i i really want to delve into this hospital or that hospital because of what you've seen so i think the the grids will be the answer uh, to, to that one in in summary form um i think there there is the debate on if, if something is uniformly requires improvement or requires improvement with a few inadequates um should that be um in in De declared inadequate overall, should it be uh, therefore put into special measures? Th these are some borderline decisions. Um, I think there we felt that uh, uh, there were two things about the Lewisham and, and Greenwich report. First of all, it is a trust that has only been a merged trust for mm. six months. Secondly, 
in terms of uh, the, the Greenwich site in particular, it was very difficult to disaggregate uh, any data. So we, although we had intelligent monitoring for Lewisham, because it had been a trust uh, in its own right before, we couldn't disaggregate information from intelligent monitoring because Greenwich had been part of the South London Healthcare Trust, and so we had a paucity of, of hard data for, the, for that trust, which is reflected, I think you'll find, in, in the, the fact that on the effectiveness rating, I think we have just said not, not assessable at this stage. Um, so um, I think equally, uh, our, one of the main uh, things that we judge as to whether something's going to go into special measures, of course, is the leadership, and we didn't feel that the leadership merited that for Lewisham and Greenwich. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Mike. Um, um, there are three principal chunks, uh, bite-sized pieces is perhaps the best way to describe them I wanted to go through. The um, finance report that you've grown accustomed to seeing, and this is probably the last time you will see it in this format, um, so to just have a, a look at that, to um, look at the way we have uh, come back to you with uh, representation of contracts over the value of £100,000, uh, to set that out, and then finally um, to just note that we plan to um, bring to public board that which we do regularly already, which is to um, present our expenses and expenditure on expenses, um, and to do that in public format every quarter. So to, to go to what I say is the presentation of the overall finance report in this format, the reason for saying it will be the last time in this structure is because, of course, it is a, uh, reporting on what is a legacy structure for CQC, and as of the 1st of April, uh, we moved to three inspectorates um, plus customer corporate services and strategy and intelligence and future finance reports will report in that way and reflect the fact that we uh, want all our directorates to um, uh, have a, a high degree of financial accountability themselves for their own performance. So um, although there will be a cumulative report, uh, that's just to talk about the way that we plan to operate in future. The uh, finance report, as set out, uh, will see us to close the 13-14 year and actually pretty much in line with what we've been forecasting for some while now, which is we're very close to um, actually achieving uh, a balanced uh, budget. We'll have a slight underspend. The, the area which um, you may hone in on, and we, indeed we are honing in on, is the underspend and capital budget. Uh, which is very significant, and it's significant, I think, for good and defensible reasons, which is that when you are in a period of very significant change, as we have been, it's very hard to make planned uh, or, indeed, productive decisions about capital investments that you want to make or need to make. Um, we are now, uh, as we are in 1415, um, looking very carefully at the capital investment we want to make. We understand what our expenditure envelope is, and we now have uh, some capacity and some experience to talk particularly about what are the systems we need to invest in that will allow us to execute our work rather better. So uh, we hope very much to bring our expenditure in 14, 15 much closer to a full spend. Uh, as ever, we are not going to spend public money unless we have good reason to do so. And uh, so the, the underspend, I think, I hope I've explained and the, the future look. Um, so I will pause there. I hope there is explanation. As I say, this is a rather legacy-based representation uh, of expenditure, but um, it shouldn't uh, be bringing any surprises to the table. It's been consistent with what's been reported, um, I think, for the last few months. So any questions on that particular element? Um, just on the overspend, I'm always more interested in overspends than underspends. Um, <laughs> And you, you've explained in the notes that the, the central labour spend is really about the legacy pension fund, which is yeah. fine. Are, you, are we going to have detail going forward on the pension liabilities in the, in the new, when you produce the new financial reports? Oh, we will do, Camilla. Um, our um, issue in not being able to report them monthly or quarterly is that, is that very often we are spending a lot of time seeking the information around them ourselves from the, patient, uh, from the pension funds to actually understand with clarity what our liabilities might be. We are actually coming to a much better position of having far fewer pension funds mm. that CQC is dealing with, and I think that will make life easier and reporting much easier in the future. Yes. 
it's also the moment to ask about this strategic risk register, which, got, which precedes that in the, in the papers, goes ahead of the finance report. That's um, paper I will attempt to take questions on it. I wasn't necessarily seeing the two together, Lewis. But uh, well, are they coming up somewhere else? Yeah, they are. They are. They follow on. That yeah. happens first. In the, in the yeah. um, I, I just wanted to ask uh, whether we're seeing any of these risks going down, because the, there is a slight risk of risk of, of us becoming uh, almost desensitized to the sort of sea of red that we see here. Um, I just want to check that um, presumably the, w where we look at impact against likelihood, the impact will always, for some of these things, will not change because if they go wrong, they will still have the same terrible impact. But um, the likelihood presumably can reduce over time because of the actions that we take. And I just wanted to just get an idea of the trajectory for what, what are otherwise a, a quite a large number of red uh, risks. Um, and in fact, the, rest, the ones that aren't red are amber, they so are. nothing is green. Yeah. Well, I think I'm, I'm not surprised by the numbers of reds and ambers that we have. I think in terms of the moment in time that we're at where we have changed almost everything in the organisation, if we were projecting green, I think you would be very legitimately saying that we were not taking a real world view of uh, the reality that we live. It, the proactive management of the risk, though, is... Uh, the trajectory, I think, is very much that we are moving reds into ambers. We have some reds which are stubborn, and we're actually working very hard on those and putting resources at them. Uh, and where things are amber and going in, the, I think the majority of those that are amber are actually the trajectory is towards green rather than back up to red. Um, but we have a very live and dynamic environment with so much change in the organisation that it's best to be realistic about that and to provide assurance that you know discussions about risk happen not just daily, but actually in the hour, in almost all the work that we do here about what, what is the risk involved mm. with what we're doing. So if I just add to that, it's the next report, but I'm quite happy that all the difficult questions go to Eileen before I present uh, this bit. But on, on this, so the Audit and Corporate Governance Committee are um, the body, which is a subcommittee of the board with the added members that they have on it as well, that will actually go through this risk register. Um, I think Eileen's answer to, to, to your question about trajectory, Lewis, was the right one. I think where I'd answer that, I think you're right to pick up on the likelihood, are these going to happen, and do we become inured to this and somehow stop paying attention to it? And um, um, so I think the vehicle to have the detailed debate on this is the Audit and, um, and Corporate Governance Committee, and it, and it does go through this. And if you remember... Uh, John, just before he left, presented quite a detailed report, which I flagged uh, when I presented the Chief Exec's report about the next stage of the transformation programme needs to pay attention to systems and process and investment in staff. And that was as a result of, I think, that committee spending about an hour and a half on the transformation programme. And many of these red-rated risks are derived from the transformation programme. So just the first one... Um, that are in revised systems don't pick up risk and then we're criticised because having said our old systems have not been effective, we introduce new systems and they're found to be wanting as well. We've just spent as a board an hour going through with Mike, Andrea and uh, Steve, what are these systems like, how robust are they, do they work, do you get under the skin, which has been a further scrutiny, if you wish, of SP1, that first risk about whether these systems are right. But because we're, this is May of the changes, as Mike said, he's in quarter one, Andrea and Steve are in wave one, they're not even in quarter one. We're still developing these systems. I think Jennifer's question's about, are we now triangulating what we get from intelligent monitoring back with the results of the inspection? Your question about, where are we in relation to intelligent monitoring for mental health? Really do just reinforce the point that we're not at any sophisticated stage of maturity in developing these systems. Paul's question, we've been doing it 10 months, and uh, yes, we have been doing it 10 months, but, but um, eight of those 10 months, we're piloting it and doing it. So I, I think it would be premature to start shifting some of these likelihoods from where they are, which is threes, into twos and ones, quite frankly. I just think it's too early to do that. I think when we get into October, 
and the autumn of this year, particularly on those things that were into our quarters, uh, the mic, uh, less so for adult social care and primary medical services, then I think um, uh, I'd, my ambition would be that we are beginning to shift those threes to two, some of those reds to ambers. Um, personally, I, I'm not of the view that we'll start moving some of those ambers truly to greens during 14-15. I think this 14-15 year is really a year of actually embedding this. This is what I was trying to say in the gap where our staff perceive you know, we've got some teams that should have eight people in them. They've got two and a half people in them. So they're carrying a workload, a, a full workload. So I promise of you'll have case loads of 40 or 30 who were between that space. We're not delivering, and we won't deliver that until later this year in some cases. So I don't think we are turned... Uh, we, are, we have stopped noticing these, uh, stopped doing these. I think... Uh, I think the whole of the conversation this morning and very often when uh, I present the Chief Executive Report and the three Chief Executives present their report, the questions that you're asking are really about that risk register without discussing the risk register in that sense. And if you just run through it, um, I, I think that they're the questions you've been asking. But my sense is we've done fantastically well over the past 12 months, but gosh, it's fragile. You know, we express that on we've done a lot, but there's more to do. And uh, we have done a lot. I, c I can't speak too highly of the efforts of my colleagues and uh, every single member of staff in the organisation, but gosh, there's still a lot more to do. And I, so I, I, I think these are about right. Um, and um, yeah, so that's where I'd go with it. So keep asking the questions. And um, let's, let's look at October, November, and then next March and, and keep asking that question of, have we got these trajectories right? Are they going in the right direction? Should they be coming down? But I personally, I wouldn't argue to start shifting SP1 from the likelihood of that happening into um, you know, where we're assessing it a medium risk. In, I wouldn't want to make that a two or a one, personally. I think this is what the Secretary of State was saying to us last night, in a way, about actually this is, he said in a different way, this year is about delivery, and we need to support our staff to deliver. And we're not there yet. Okay. This will go back to the Audit Committee, anyway, won't it? Uh, it comes to the audit basis. committee to every single meeting of that and it will committee. Come, does it come to us twice a year or something? Uh, it should come in summation once a year, but it can okay, once it twice. I think the point uh, quarterly is, uh, I mean, I think Lewis's underlying point is we to get used to looking at it if we're not careful. Yes. So I think it's better to come infrequently and then we can see if there's any change or not. Yes, no, indeed. Yeah, that's, okay. a, that's a very fair point. Thank you. Okay. Um, so can we just uh, move on to the consultancy spend, um, which is... Uh, presenting to you uh, contracts over £100,000 that were let in 1314, um, and that represents, as is shown here, 96% of the spend. Actually, 94% um, of this total spend actually came from our transformation budget. So, what I hope it's setting out is a, a pattern that purchasing um, consultancy support at this level is not normal activity for the organisation it is actually linked to the changes that have been made. Uh, and so the contracts uh, set out here um, do have explanation around them in terms of what they were for, um, and they have been closely and tightly managed to make sure that they come in on budget um, with requirements fulfilled where there's been a need for proactive contract management. That has happened. Um, but we are not going to be spending as much in 1415 because we are in a different phase of the organisation. But... Certainly, I think if you find it helpful, we can um, bring uh, a quarterly report on consultancy spend to the board um, above a de minimis level, uh, if that uh, would suit you. And also to note what I think is important, um, and it's just a, a slight variation to what we have been doing. All our contracts, although you would have to look hard for them that we let, are actually on the Cabinet Office website um, it, so that they are open and, and transparent to all. Um, we just decided that it's much easier for people to navigate who are interested in such matters, so we're going to put all the contracts that we let up on our own website also, so that there will be um, a, a way of navigating straight to contracts that we let from our own website rather than having to go through the Cabinet Office. Um, so that's happening with immediate effect, uh, if that's okay. So, so we're saying we'll put every quarter? We'll every we'll quarter we can bring, uh, bring this back if the board mm -hmm. would like to see it. Fine. I think we should definitely do that. 
Any, any questions on the consultancy contract? No? No, okay. that's great. Um, and then the, the final piece again, which is um, something that uh, I've been reviewing since I arrived, uh, because as David would say, I'm a very sad person, uh, is, is to look at our uh, expenditure on uh, expenses right across the organisation. And um, what, again, I'm proposing it would be good practice to do is to just bring in tabulated form again quarterly um, expenditure uh, for the uh, executive team around expenses. And uh, then I think we will also aim to bring um, expenditure more generally on expenses to the board at least twice a year. Or do you want to do it on, on a, you were thinking of doing it on a monthly basis, I think, expenses. Oh, um, l let's settle. I mean, I think this is in the interest of transparency. Thanks, Andy. Uh, sorry, David. Uh, um, um, I think the issue is about, on both the consultancy contracts and expenses, this is about transparency. Um, it seems to me that if we don't put them out, we're going to get asked for them, and then it looks like this is being dragged out of us. So the only way to deal with this is make a virtue out of being transparent. I don't think we've got anything to hide on what we've done in either consultancy or in our expenses. So I think we should just make it part of our routine business to report these publicly so that um, colleagues, um, non-executive colleagues, can scrutinise uh, both the contracts and the expenses but also because these are public meetings and we're reporting a public way, there's no mystery or secrecy about these things. Uh, for a large national devolved decentralised organisation where senior managers need to be visible, I don't think these are difficult expenses. Um, similarly, I think uh, the way that Eileen's presented the consultancy, which is 92% of this spend has really been about bringing in the capability to make sure that we can make some of the changes. I think there's an explicable narrative to that. 5.8 million is a lot of money, no two ways about it. But our purpose in actually bringing in the capacity was to do the work that we needed to do. So I think there's um, helpful explanations. People outside of CQC will determine whether they're satisfied by those, but the way to deal with it is just to make them transparent. So I think the issue, David, is what's the frequency we need to bring these to give that transparency rather than um, uh, 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 allow people to raise questions. These kind of things come quite regularly. We're making spending decisions. We're incurring expenses on a monthly basis. So you're going to get a monthly finance report. So it just makes sense yeah, to actually um, build it in. Uh, we can certainly do it monthly if you prefer that. Uh, I'm just going on the practice of other boards that I've observed where it comes quarterly. So I'm very happy to take it either way, depending on what you would like, really. Have got any strong feelings? No. Oh, let's leave it. We'll think about it a bit more. Either it'll be no later than quarterly, but possibly monthly. Okay. okay. Thank you. Are uh, you doing the performance? Yeah, so I think Paul might help with this, um, and uh, Chief Inspector colleagues um, uh, as well. So. Um, I do apologise. Um, we're presenting the um, final quarter of 1314. Um, the next agenda item is how we'll present both the finance data and the performance data for the year that we're now in 1415. So this effectively is the last of the years. And um, the way we'll present these reports at subsequent meetings, David, is that I'll do an overarching presentation, then each Chief Inspector or Executive Director will speak to their bits in terms of the detailed questions. So a, a, it's a change where Paul, because his team put these together, has been presenting this, and um, I think that's probably a better distribution of the accountability for the work rather than Paul's team that are drawing it together. So coming to item 8B, the uh, overall um, uh, summary report pulls out what the noticeable uh, performance highlights are during the year in terms of the inspections. I'm not going to present it. Uh, I've touched on some of this in the Chief Executive Report, but uh, the completion of the programme, um, the publishing of the documents, creation of new executive teams, the delivery of the transformation programme, the launch of the academy, are some of the things that we're um, pulling out there. Paragraph 3 we've pulled out and probably given more commentary on those things that we set out to achieve in the year that we didn't. Uh, registrations within eight weeks, second opinion appointed doctors, and final inspection reports. 
um, all missed for different reasons the performance uh, ambition that was set at the beginning of the year. Lewis has already invited us into a conversation on the strategic risk register. Um, and um, um, uh, I think we've had the discussion about this is flagging the risk, but it will be premature to start shifting those risks. And um, we'll, we'll report on these uh, in the future. And then the last bit, and uh, touched on to a certain extent in the finance report, in paragraph five, is the uh, uh, progress on the transformation programme. If I could just uh, very briefly and finally um, invite colleagues to look at um, page two of the slide pack. And uh, I think you'll see, effectively, in terms of our operational services, inspection and registration, slides, um, well, effectively, 4 to 12 set out our performance against um, adult social care, the NHS, primary medical services, uh, in terms of inspection and our performance. And critically, um, uh, where we've taken enforcement action. I, I do think one of the... Um, quiet successes of last year was the fact that not only did we do more inspections but our enforcement activity increased. There was always a risk going back to the risk register that what we'd end up doing is trading enforcement activity just to get the work done. That we took an optimistic view and I think uh, this figure gives us some comfort that we didn't do that. Um, our enforcement activity went up uh, during that year. Registration has seen an increase and a spike in their activities and I think slide 12 pulls out um, um, what some of the trends that they've uh, been experiencing. Uh, registration can often get forgotten as we talk about inspection and the progress but nevertheless is a hugely important uh, part of our work and uh, as we move forward with um, these increased powers that we've got to change the notice of proposals will become increasingly important it strikes me moving forward. And then slides 14, 15 and 16 are really about the internal workings of CQC rather than our external work about our HR activity. And I think there's some good st uh, statistics in here for the end of the year just in terms of uh, just the recruitment activity but also our retention activity, the number of people that have stayed with us and, um, and uh, uh, turnover and uh, sickness levels uh, and sickness rates which I think continue to be good indicators of uh, the commitment to CQC staff to get the job done and uh, stay with us. So um, I won't say any more than that, David. Um, that, I think, presents um, the final report on 13-14. The figures in this report, once they're audited, uh, that's a delegation I asked for in the end of my report, will actually find their way into the annual report, which is on a trajectory to end up being presented to Parliament in July, and that will uh, help us discharge our responsibilities um, to produce the annual report. Thanks. Um, thanks, Dick. Paul, did you want to add anything? No? Uh, yeah, I mean, just to say that, you know, just looking at um, slide three, the, the scorecard summary, and just actually we have kind of delivered on what we said we would deliver. So it's, um, you know, very impressive during a extremely um, time of, of extreme change. So I think that's, you know, really, really good. Um, the specific question I, I had was... Um, that enforcement's up by 50%, and I just wondered w what the reasons were for that. Because um, it's quite a big jump, and I just wondered if there were other factors other than people working really hard and making sure they didn't sort of take, take their eye off the ball. So. It's interesting, it is up by 50%, but it still runs about 5 it is 5% of the inspections lead, which is quite, still quite low, I would have thought. Um, is there a reason, reason why it's gone up from one year to the other? To the other? Well, I think we've pressed on it. Yeah. So I think uh, Andrea's report talked about the use of um, fines in relation to the absence of registered managers. I think, I think the board has challenged the executive uh, over about an 18-month period about what are you doing, how are you getting this up. So I think there is a sense that um, sitting down and then planning how we do that is making uh, some results. I I think there's also um, 
the organisation paradoxically has felt more settled. Um, people have actually got on and said, actually, we are going to challenge unacceptable care. And I think people have felt supported to challenge unacceptable care. So in addition to the registered managers activity, I just think it represents a greater confidence in staff and managers. And I, and I think um, Rebecca's team as well in uh, legal in taking more. I think David's got absolutely the challenge, but it, it, it's stuck at about 5%. And is that enough, given the levels of poor care? And I think the slide which uh, we've looked at on numerous occasions, which is slide seven, um, which is the amount of um, uh, care which has been assessed in using the old methodology as being non-compliant non for more than six months, more than nine months, and more than 12 months, um, really does give uh, I think some focus to whether that 5% is the right figure. This is rather saying we actually probably should be doing more than we've been doing and that I think is a challenge for this next period. Um, certainly I think on adult social care and the work Steve's been, uh, sorry, on uh, hospitals and uh, primary medical services with the fair, in inverted commas failure regimes, we've got clear about what some of the time scales are going to be before we will take action and how long uh, people are going to be given to start turning around services and I think there's a similar conversation that we need to begin having about what's a reasonable period of time for these services to turn around and when should we begin to see evidence and I think we need to extend that into adult social care as well. So there's a big piece of work to do around enforcement but I don't think there's one simple single reason why that's gone up by 50%. I think there's a combination. Rebecca, how do you feel it's going on the enforcement side? I think David's right that there has been an increase in confidence in taking enforcement activity. Um, but I think there's a lot more that we can do to um, embed the skills of you know, those who are already at the top end to make it uniform, because what we don't have is consistency. Um, I think um, getting our enforcement policy right um, when we have the new framework is going to be really important because that will explain more publicly how we come to the decisions that we do on enforcement. Um, and I wouldn't underestimate the sort of scale of the challenge actually to, to get to the point where every inspector has got all the skills they need to get the evidence, you know, to get that first inspection absolutely right so that then we can follow it through. Um, we, we don't have that uniformly now, um, but that plays into what David was saying about the, the training that we need to do between now and October to sort of hit the ground running with the new framework. Mm. Okay. Paul, sorry, Paul and Michael. Yeah. So at the moment, this is the, the structure is around sort of 20, 25% non-compliance with the majority of that then resulting in a compliance action, uh, and then the vast, vast majority of what we don't do on the compliance action is a warning notice. That's almost the top of what we do. There's a, as you can see on the sort of left-hand side of page 11, there are an extremely small number of cases where we go beyond warning. Now, as the regulations change and as we look to our new enforcement policy, I think one of the things we're looking at is currently we have an, an escalation ladder, I think as it's called, so you sort of step up. But linking to Kay's point at the beginning of the, of the board meeting, if there are things that are just happening that should not happen and we have the fundamental standards to prove or to sort of set the basis in law, then I think we need to be looking at why, do, why we should just go to the most appropriate action straight away. Mm -hmm. So one thing that we might see in future reports is more direct to prosecutions. Mm. Yeah. Michael. It's really a question of um, clarification. On page four, under the heading, you know, take the second uh, section of page four on the right, it says 4,679 locations cancel their registration in the year. Now, this suggested to me, but I don't know how to think about this, that there is a very large amount of churn mm -hmm. happening. So I just wondered what was causing that and whether these figures had spiked or this was what happens every year and does it literally mean that 
um, nearly 5,000 um, locations actually close every year or are they transferred or what happens to them. And that it also, on page 12, which has got the number of registrations, I was also surprised by this figure that um, CQC received 48,472 registration applications. Well, that also felt like a very high number. And, you know, I'm not quite sure which, um, uh, highly, you know, who the right person to ask about these are. But, um, as I say, both these numbers struck me as being numbers that were worth thinking about and understanding what was driving them. <laughs> yeah. I think I think Andrea will come in on the specifics of the numbers, but, okay. I, but I think it's really well worth um, noting because it's important that the the sheer upswing in the amount of activity around registration and mm. people who are connecting and contacting with us uh, is having a huge impact on our front door, which is the um, NCSC in Newcastle, um, and they are doing sterling work in actually dealing with this upswing uh, in contact. Um, but uh, we need to look carefully at it because it, it seems to be a trend that we are going to have to live with. Uh, uh, and Andrea, I don't know if you lead on registration if you want to pick up on that. Yes, thank you. Um, and, and one of the things, I mean, yes, there is churn, and, and, I'm, and sadly I, I don't know what the kind of uh, historical context is, so um, I'm sure we can, we can come back um, uh, uh, on that, Michael. Um, but in terms of the numbers of applications we get, what, what's not shown here, uh, and I can't remember the specific percentage, but there's a, a very high percentage of applications that people make that we reject um, for a variety of different reasons. So one of the things that we're looking at in the Registration Design and Delivery Board is actually how can we take um, our process and the information that we're providing to people as, uh, 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 kind of further back and actually do some, if you like, preventative work um, around being much, much clearer about the information that's on our website that we share with people that basically says, if you can't answer these basic questions, if you can't kind of you know, uh, um, uh, uh, commit to um, these legally um, uh, binding requirements, et cetera, et cetera, then don't even pass go um, because actually you know, you, you're, you're not going to make the grade. Um, because what happens at the moment is that people put in pretty speculative um, applications which we have to treat properly and, and reject, but that's a very inefficient and ineffective use of our time. So one of the things that I'd really like us to be able to do is to, be, is to, is to think about ourselves as um, uh, providing much better information to people who are thinking about making applications or changing um, uh, their registration uh, so that um, we can we can be more efficient and effective but also so that people people can make much better informed decisions about what they're applying to do so there is quite a bit of work to be done on that uh, on, on Andrew's point a lot of the um, the rejections and the high rejection rate has been because it's been a manual process to submit a word document um, and what we have seen is if we've moved to the online services, which uh, we've done for primary medical services to start with and are rolling out to all the other services, there's something like over a 50% drop in the rejection rate when it's done online, from, frankly, because you can prompt people to say, you have not filled in this box, and if it's probably because they've forgotten it, whereas if it's just sent in as a completed form, you have to reject if they've missed a box. So that's, that's very good for us, but it's also good for providers. Um, uh, my, on, your, on your point about the total number, um, that's total number of applications, and a lot of those aren't new providers but, uh, or even new locations. There'll be an existing location uh, looking to register a new activity. Um, so that's probably a large proportion of the difference between the, the churn figure, as you described it, and the new application figure. Uh, and again, the churn figure isn't, wouldn't necessarily be about the, uh, the asset, the location no longer being there, uh, any shift from... Uh, one provider owning it to another provider owning it, but with continuity of care would still require a new application and a deregistration of the old one. But, so, if you can make it the last question, Kay. Okay, um, it's slide 13 and it's the SOAD um, requests for ECT. And in the last quarter, 
um, it's gone down to 38%, which is um, you know, quite a significant drop. And I know there are ongoing problems with recruiting cell ads and, and that, that Paul Elliott is, is looking at that. And that's quite a, a significant drop. And it, essentially it means that either people, are very ill people are waiting for ECT or more likely are giving it under, e under emergency powers. So I just wondered um, you know, why there, there's been such a drop and um, what are we doing to sort of at least get it back up to where, to where it was? Mike, can I take that one away <laughs> and come back to you? Right, I think unless there's any other questions, we should probably um, move to the end of the public meeting. Any questions from the, the floor? Yeah. We? So, oh, sorry, there's one more item. Yeah. What is the other? Which is, oh, yes, yeah. David, you're going to do that. Yeah. So I'll do Sorry. this quickly, uh, David, taking the, um, taking the encouragement. Um, so in presenting the fourth quarter report for 13-14, I signalled that uh, there's been work undertaken uh, to redesign the reporting process. And what you've got at item, the last item on the agenda, David, is a new performance scorecard. Um, Paul's team have developed this. I know there have been a number of discussions between both executive members of the board and non-executive members of the board, which have been uh, very helpful. The annex to the report is, um, is a created annex. This isn't real data. Um, but it's showing you how we would intend to present um, performance and finance information um, for um, CQC for the year 14-15. So the first of these you'll be getting is in July, where you'll get the April, May, June, the first quarter of both financial performance and operational performance uh, for, for this current year. I don't intend to go through it slide by slide, but what we're trying to do is actually keep what was good from the previous um, um, previous reporting system, I, I think uh, where there's been resistance to uh, progress and change, the um, um, uh, the slide that we looked at on slide seven on the last report is in here, but it's now broken down to represent the uh, directorates that each chief inspector leads, uh, and you'll get greater granularity. And, and Michael, I hope some of the questions that you just asked on what's behind some of those numbers, uh, this presentation will make that more accessible. Um, um, so, David, rather than go through and try and present it, um, I hope this um, really uh, meets the uh, board's requirements for a more granular and more accessible um, performance and finance reports that represents and reflects, re better than represents, reflects uh, how we're organised as um, uh, an organisation and uh, would allow that greater scrutiny uh, from the board and a greater transparency for members of the public that um, uh, stakeholders and other key people that um, are interested in this information and want to access it and uh, interrogate it. I I'll, I'll leave it there. Generally speaking, do people feel this is an improvement on what we've had in the past? Yeah, yeah, I think it's, yeah. Camilla, are you happy with it? <laughs> um, I mean, it's difficult to really, until we've actually got the real numbers in here, it's quite difficult to really sort of. Um, <laughs> but it, feel, it feels much better to me. So shall we, can we try it? Oh, Mike, you wanted to can, comment. Can I just enter a, a caveat, uh, which, um, which is w when we're looking at trends in good and outstanding ratings, clearly in the hospital sector, where we have been selecting high-risk uh, yeah. trusts, and, and we're not just doing, a, a, if you like, a, a random sample each quarter, um, or we may get some funny trends where things will suddenly look better or suddenly look worse, depending on which groups we're selecting. But just... Yeah. Good. Um, thanks very much. Uh, Eileen, thanks for doing, getting all the work pulled together on this as well. It's a, um, well and, and Paul. Yeah. Yeah, it was very much a team effort yeah. led by Mark, Mark Edmonds, I have to say, so we're, we're very grateful to him for that. Okay. Good. Thanks very much. Um, questions from the floor? Um, David, uh, 
As usual, my questions are mainly towards Andrea. Um, under the old regime in the CQC, there were quite a lot of instances where CQC gave um, providers a clean bill of health. Then somebody put in a camera and a very different story was told. And that's gone down, but it hasn't disappeared. And the old deanery is an example of where that sort of thing happens. I'm sure that every single person around this table would want to reduce that sort of thing to the absolute minimum. For it, you need uh, the, tr the trouble. It really happens because you can't get into the corners. Uh, uh, you can't see everything. Cameras do help with that, and they're also objective. If they weren't objective, it wouldn't have been possible for seven people to be dismissed in open house. So uh, I do hope that, uh, I, I think this is the reason why in the round table, nobody actually said cameras shouldn't happen at all. There were definite restrictions on it. So if you were to actually have the word camera a bit more in the mitigating action column of the risk register, I think you might be able to get a bit more green in the rag column. Um, <clears throat> Secondly, uh, one way you can help cameras, and this is, I've got a very personal example. I tried to put a camera in a, in a home once. I came to grief because I couldn't work the wretched thing <laughs> at all. And secondly, I wouldn't have even known where to put it. I think the CQC could do a lot to help with that. Um, and particularly the CQC could uh, set itself up as being the place, the first port of call when you've got some footage, rather than going to the Daily Mail or to Panorama or anywhere else. In other words, to be not just responsive, but encouraging. Then going back finally to what Steve was saying about if I were a commissioner, I'd much rather be inspected through the lens of my providers than to have an actual visit from the CQC. And I particularly I still like to see the CQC inspecting commissioners and in particular local authorities. Thanks, David. Andrew, do you just want to respond? Um, yes. Um, I mean, thank you. I, th I think the... Um, the issue about cameras we discussed and you know, they're, they're, we will come out with a, 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 a position statement after the consultation has ended and, and it was very helpful to have your points of view um, uh, at the round table as well, David. So thank you very much for, for doing that. I think that the point that you're making that um, CQC could be could do a lot in terms of being the first port of call when people not taking uh, uh, information uh, to you know, the, the, the press or, 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 or the TV. In one of the circumstances that was um, in the Panorama programme, which was open house, um, actually the family took the, the footage to um, the management of the home directly in 2012 when it happened. They responded very quickly. They involved us um, and, uh, and, and the kind of consequences uh, happened. Um, it were, you know, uh, it, it, it was um, awful footage, as you quite rightly say, but it did actually generate the immediate response that was required, as opposed to um, uh, 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 undercover reporters uh, reporting on things and then waiting several months before they share it, um, which doesn't allow us to take that immediate action. So I think uh, encouraging people to go either um, to the uh, management of the, the service or indeed to us, um, it is an important thing in terms of us being able to respond and to respond in a timely fashion, which I think is really important. I'll any, any other comments? Yes, please, Chair. Thank you. My name's Ian Stevens. I'm at King's College. I'm looking at corporate governance. Um, and my, I have a question for Professor Sir Mike. Um, we discussed, well, the, the meeting discussed domain level and service level um, scrutiny of the um, of trusts. Uh, I wonder if you could comment on the um, the governance and control level scrutiny when you do your uh, assessments of um, of trusts, uh, because there is a, a layer of governance that is provided. Th for instance, the um, the the, the um, elected governors, um, uh, which would, I think would have quite a serious bearing on the behavior of those boards. In, in all our inspections, uh, we look at particularly the governance of quality and safety, as that is what we're really looking at. Uh, we uh, will normally interview chair and chief executive, but also the, the non-executive directors, and particularly the non-executive directors who are chairing 
quality and safety committees, whatever they may be called in different trusts. Um, in foundation trusts, where there are governors, uh, we also tend to meet with the governors as a group to get their views uh, on quality and, and safety and also to see how closely they, they are engaged with the trust. And I have to say, we have observed quite a variation in that from, from, from governors who are very highly in, engaged and that have a very close idea of what is going on and are obviously working closely but separately from the, uh, the, the, the board. And, you know, I've been to one place where we, they said, we are not mini NEDs um, and they, they they knew that was their role and so I, I think we do look at all, all of that and of course we also look at written reports of governance uh, meetings particularly related to quality as, as we go through. Uh, thank you Chair. Uh, Robin Pike. A um, couple if I may quickly. Uh, going back to the care bill, which is uh, an early part of the meeting, um, and the regulations which are under discussion for implementation on, on October the 1st, from a, a patient perspective, what do, what do you think the impact will be in a, a particular circumstance such as a never event? Um, at Watford Hospital, there have been several never events recently, including a non a wrong site surgery. Um, would that constitute a threshold for prosecution? Uh, it would depend on the circumstances. I think that, that that's the first thing to say. In general, no, um, but we certainly always look at never events and we use them as one of our assessments of the past safety uh, of, of, a, of a trust over the previous 12 months uh, but we're also looking at a whole range of things about safety it was it safe in the past is it safe now is it likely to be safe in the future which for example we can look at by have they got an open learning culture are they being encouraged to report incidents uh, minor incidents as well as major incidents um, so that will be one uh, factor clearly if there had been a number of never events and they had all been occurring in the same part of the hospital, so supposing it's not just within surgery, uh, which is where most never events occur, but it's within one branch of surgery, we would look very c carefully at that and to want to look at the, the, the governance of, of that. Are they using the, the WHO surgical checklist properly? Um, and so we would, we would look at a whole range of different factors uh, before making up our minds. But uh, if we feel that there has certainly been willful um, and negligence and, and neglect, that then we could take action. I'll just add to that. Uh, so um, Mike's absolutely right. So one of the regulations is called um, safe care and treatment, and that is where it would apply. But also remember um, the duty of candour is about the reporting of those openly and honestly, and that will be subject to a regulation. And um, although it's not in this report, but we flagged it separately, there's a separate set of responsibilities for how we work with the health and safety executive, uh, which also pick up on the issues about safety. So um, I think your question prompts me to think that we need to be really clear in our guidance about how we see that applying. Um, um, never events by definition are never events, but never events do happen. And the issue isn't do they happen, it's what happens when they happen and how does somebody respond to them, I think is the key issue. Uh, and that's why uh, I think Mike's um, uh, answer was about they won't apply in all circumstances, but there may be some where people are willful where uh, they will apply. And I made the distinction earlier about civil and criminal prosecutions. Um, the regulation around safe care and treatment is potentially a criminal prosecution. Uh, thank you, and, and very briefly, if I may, a question about pharmacies. Um, pharmacies in the community are, I think, increasingly delivering some medical services, um, which are, are moving from general practice into community pharmacies. Uh, is there any inspection by any agency of the, those pharmacies and within hospitals, the pharmacies um, 
from a patient perspective, can uh, lead to poor experiences, um, both for patients who are waiting to be discharged from the hospital and to obtain their medications before they can leave, and also for outpatients who have been prescribed medication and have to go through the hospital pharmacy. Are either or both inspected? The, the, the issue of um, pharmacy, in particular medicines being available before discharge, is something that we do routinely look at. Um, and most frequently, it's within our medical care um, uh, um, core service, and we would look at that at within the responsive domain for medical care. So, um, and we do quite often uh, observe that people are waiting for several hours in the discharge lounge while they are uh, just to get their, their medication. And this, by the way, also comes through in the CQC inpatient survey. So there is, well, there's a specific question on that. So we can corroborate between the survey and what we hear on inspection. And it is quite frequently a cause for us saying that the responsive domain of medicine requires improvement. And on community pharmacists, we don't do that. There's a separate body that looks at community pharmacists, and that's not our responsibility. Okay, here goes Robin, then. Oh. Well, I just wanted, sorry, very, very briefly, on your question about cameras. Um, Andrew, you said you were going to publish a position statement. Is that going to come to the board? Is that a sort of policy? Is it going to come to the board before? Yes, yes, yes absolutely. Okay, it, it'll, be, it'll be as a consequence of the consultation that we've done on the provider handbooks. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not going to make it up by myself. I can <laughs> right, thanks very much. Coffee.